what happens to brain development after you've stopped physically growing, they would say, well, you're pretty much set for life. Your brain doesn't really change once you stop physically growing. When we got functional MRI scanners, that shows that that isn't the case. All our brains are changing all the time via a process called neuroplasticity. We, our brains are made up of about 100 billion neurons. What I learned was that the psychological sciences are about 70 years behind the physiological sciences. Imagine it's 12 months from now and you've achieved your major life goals. How does it feel to be in the best shape of your life? To wake up energized, excited about the day, to have great relationships and friends who support you and propel you forward. How does it feel to have an excess of money, to be able to make the choices you want, to be fearless and open to trying new adventures? Imagine being connected to the universe and it providing everything you desire. It's possible over time, and your past does not dictate your future. The only thing holding you back from this vision is you. It's time to take control of our thoughts and use them to our advantage. Welcome to Richer Soul, where we achieve our dreams and bring balance to health, wealth, relationships, time, and spirituality. If you have not had a chance to listen to episodes one through nine, I encourage you to go back and listen to the framework behind Richer Soul and how to create the life of your dreams. You can also find all the show notes for this episode at richersoul.com. Hey, it's Rocky. Welcome to Richer Soul. Today's guest is Dr. John Finn, who will teach us to be a habit mechanic. I do not know who said today's quote, but it's super applicable to today's episodes. Habits are like cobwebs that turn into cables. They can then hold you up or pull you down. So that's the question. Do your habits pull you up or do they pull you down? Our guest is going to talk about that today. He's a high performance coach. His name is Dr. John Finn. He is the founder of the award winning consultancy Tougher Minds. He's got over two decades of experience expertise in performance psychology, resilience, and leadership science. He's worked with top companies and elite athletes worldwide, researching how to adapt habits that drive high achievement. His book distills all of these science-based techniques down to simple steps that we can all take to build empowering new routines. He'll chat with us today about insights from neuroscience, psychology to help us understand why we get stuck in ruts of destructive thinking and behaviors. The reality is we've talked about before, our brains are wired to conserve energy by relying on ingrained habits, even if they're harmful. So if you struggle with this like I do, You'll get a whole new perspective and some ideas on some changes you can make. Let's meet our guest. Welcome to Richer Soul, Dr. John Finn. It's great to have you join us today. Well, thank you for having me, Rocky. I'm delighted to be here. And I am excited to learn from you today. We always like to start at the beginning. What was it like when you were growing up and how much did your family and school teach you about money? Yeah, my father's self-employed, self-made guy, came from nothing, very successful business person now. So I think having the leader of the household who was scrapping and fighting to create his own business, which went through ups and downs, I think, as every business does, that was really interesting. But I think it always made me aware of the scarcity of money and resources, there wasn't always a guarantee that we could even, you never got to the point where we couldn't put food on the table, but you know, there was sometimes some warnings, we need to be careful with money now because things are not so good. Um, but also seeing the flip side of that when things were really good. And um, so I think really overarchingly, just the consciousness, a lot of my uh, friends, families, you know, had 
just steady, normal job. So there was always that income coming in. They would be going on holiday every year. They would always know where the next thing was coming from. Whereas I suppose in our household, it was a bit more boom and bust. Um, and then having set up my own business myself, I think, um, yeah, I'm aware of that. Even though things might maybe going well right now, you never know what's around the corner, especially in the world that we live in. And I think the probably the most important thing, I, I suppose this ties back to what is that one of the, th- one because I used to work as a, as a younger, um, as a younger guy, I'd work laboring in my dad's businesses and also my grandfather's businesses. Um, but they're all very entrepreneurial outside of the family. But this idea that you never lose an hour. So every hour you invest in something is going to pay you back in somewhere, even if um, it isn't immediate. And that's what, how I, I still like that thinking that all this time and effort that we invest in ourselves as self-employed business people, it's going to come back. It's going to pay us back at some point. So yeah, so that's a little snapshot, I suppose, of my relationship with money and um, what I learned as a kid growing up. Were there intentional conversations or was this more because of what you observed occurring? There was definitely times where we said, we need to be careful with money now, you know. We don't, there's, the contract may have gone awry or, you know, something's happened. My dad pivoted a few times. So yeah, definitely aware. We need to be conscious with money. Do you think that put limits on you later in life as you started to get older and make your money and do your business? I think it's part of how I, my core belief systems about how I think about myself. I think I'm pretty good at managing money. Um, I know some people that are not good at all. Um, I think I'm pretty, pretty good. And I think a lot of that goes, you can go back to those roots, you know. And that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I, it, it's funny how the entrepreneurial world seems to be boom and bust and everyone thinks Having a job is safe, except in today's economy where everyone gets laid off and then you really see the bust. But people don't seem to be aware that they can lose their job. They think it's safe, but in the reality of this ever-changing world, it isn't so safe. And, And as technology comes along, so many careers are obsoleted, but at the same time, so many new things are created. Yeah, I think that. I know lots of your listeners run their own businesses and I think until you have, you don't really know what it's like. I think people that don't run their own businesses really underestimate how difficult and challenging it is. But also, it's deeply rewarding. We have the quitting quietly movement at the moment, don't we, where people are just turning up and going through the motions. I just think, why do you just set up your own business? If you don't like what you do, just put all your effort into something you do like doing. It's. Um, I was speaking to a guy yesterday who told me that he's um, he's got a few businesses. He's a marketing guy, but he has, he has a he has a training business that turns over uh, three million dollars a year, and he sells um, e-commerce training. You know, and I genuinely believe that everybody now, if they've got a laptop and an internet connection, and the desire to learn, they can easily earn well in US currency over one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year because it's so easy now to reach people and uh, position your product and there's lots of different ways you can get a competitive advantage in terms of selling so yeah i think um i relate you know my grandparents were working in the factory when they were 14 years old in the heartland of the industrial revolution um there were jobs for everybody who wanted them they learned their main trades maybe when they were in their late teens early 20s and then they were set for life you know they turned up, they did the same job every day. When they went home, there was no emails. There was, for a period, no TV even. And then af- after a period, TV stopped at a certain time. And there wasn't much to do after a certain time in the evening. So the world is, you know, the only constant in the world is, is change, isn't it? And I think the that was true before the pandemic, but the pandemic really accelerated that. Um, people are not coping particularly well. In the UK right now, we've got, Two and a half million people who are signed off on this. Our population is only 70 million people. So two and a half million of our working age people are signed off on sick. Of that figure, 1.5 million uh, list either as the primary or secondary reason for being sick as anxiety, 
action. I know that in, in the US, um, I think it's 23% of the US American adult population, according to the most recent figures from the Brookings Institute, have a mental health challenge. And actually, that data also shows that if you have a mental health challenge now between the ages of 27 to 35, by the time you get to 50, your average earnings is 24% lower than those people that didn't have a mental health challenge in that period. I think that period is that time in life where we're settling down, getting into long-term relationships, getting our first serious responsibilities in the workplace. So I think that data mirrors how challenging and complex the world is right now. And I don't think that the mainstream solutions we have for those challenges work. They weren't designed to help people to um, actually think better and, and feel better and build better habits in those areas. They were designed to help people to know what to do differently. But as, as we know, most people know and agree it's a good idea to walk 10,000 steps a day and to eat five portions of fruits and vegetables. Yet certainly in the UK, our National Health Service spends over half its annual budget. To put this in context, the, the National Health Service is the biggest company in Europe. It spends half its annual budget treating diseases that emerge because people don't do what they agree is a good idea to do. That is, do sensible levels of exercise and eat healthily. So we've got a huge crisis and it's, I think well, when we get through this winter, it's going to be even worse. So I'm painting a very, very negative picture of the world here, aren't I, Rocky? Sorry, you've got me started. Well, but let me ask you a question. Why do you think so many people have that underlying anxiety issue and that problem? In a nutshell, if we strip it back to its basics, Homo sapiens, our species, are designed to control how they feel and how they're perceived by important people in their lives. Because those two things are central for survival. And right now, we live in a world where we are being bombarded almost on a millisecond level with information that challenges um, those two ideas. So, or that makes me think that I can improve one of those two areas. So that is how I feel. So I'm going to check social media. I'm going to eat the donut. I'm not going to go outside for a walk. I'm going to stay up later. Or that makes me think I can increase my social status in the eyes of important people in my life. So we're being bombarded by things to a level that our brain is just not designed to, to deal with that volume of information. So I think that just the basics of sleeping well, eating well, exercising properly, those basic things we need to do well to get our brain working well are harder than ever to do than ever before. So I think we can, I absolutely believe that we live in a period of history where it is more difficult than ever before to feel well and do well and by extension lead well because we are just being bombarded. The last bastion of good sleep, good diet, good exercise, and the reason they're important is because they get our, help our brain to work well. The last bastion was exercise. So we got to a point nearly three years ago now, or maybe it's more than three years ago, you lose track of time <laughs> with the pandemic where people didn't even have to leave the house anymore to work. So diet and sleep had taken a bit, bit of a shellacking over the previous, over the 10 years before that. But then all of a sudden, we didn't even have to exercise anymore. And to put it into context, Homo sapiens are designed anthropologically to walk about 12 miles per day. We are designed to move around and solve problems, problems relating to survival. So in other words, we're designed to get control over our environments, feel good, how we perceive by others. So it's, it's harder than ever to get our brains working well. Um, and I, I think the real reason why, for example, more people are not sleeping very well is stress. It's the volume of stress we're having to deal with. And, and a stress occurs just because we get what we call a disconnection between what we think is going to happen versus what's happening. Um, that could be 
an, a, a little example of that is I hold the door open for someone and I expect them to say thank you, but they ignore me. That's a disconnection. It could be about the political environment. It could be about the, the, the Ukraine war. It could be about I go to the supermarket and expect them to stock this stuff, but because there's a supply chain crisis, they don't have it. It could be the way your partner looks at you when you walk through the door, you expect them to say, hey, how are you doing? Do you have a good day? And they don't. So we're just connected now. We're being bombarded with information that is causing more disconnections in our meaning systems than ever before. What happens when you get a disconnection? You get a fight or fight response going on in your brain. So that's driving depression and anxiety. And if we take a few steps back from being clinically depressed or anxious, it's driving poorer brain function, brain fog, low energy levels, not feeling good. We're now seeing generative AI do being able to do most of the things that we're employing humans to do. The thing that generative AI can't do is the work, the type of work that our prefrontal cortex brain can do. Um, we call that high charge, high impact work. So it's harder to get into the into a place, and we can maybe do at our best. We can maybe do four to five hours of that type of work each day. It's harder than ever to get into that brain uh, to allow us to do that that really clever work. So there's a whole there's a whole buffet of things. Sorry that I'm covering here, Rocky, but I suppose it's quite a broad introduction to some quite challenging things we're experiencing as human beings, individually and collectively, and they're not going away. They're getting more intense. So we're going to dig into all of this in your book. Before we do, I want to take a step back. How did you become an expert in this? You've got a quite a bit of education, and you've worked quite a bit, I believe, in sports psychology as well, or, or worth elite athletes, correct? Here's a short story. I was always very good at playing sport. Uh, I was a very good rugby player. And when I went to university, I got selected in the national student team, um, international uh, student team training squad. And we were, we were in a warm-up game before we were going to play Australia. Um, in a test and I choked under pressure really messed up and at that time I was studying sports psychology at university and I was it really just brought home those lessons I'd been learning in the lecture theatre and the seminars and why am I not thinking in that way why am I telling myself that I, I'm going to drop this ball instead of telling myself catch the ball I'm going to catch the ball but anyway so that so I have this elite I suppose not maybe not elite level, but um, high high level sporting experience that really brought home the the sports science lessons I was I was learning at the university. At that time, I ruptured quad muscle, which meant that I just couldn't train anymore to the intensity that I needed to train. And I was nineteen at this point, so I was studying sports science, uh, physiology, psychology, motor control, nutrition. I really liked the sports psychology, and I thought, well, if I can't compete as an elite athlete, a high level athlete. Maybe the next best thing is to support athletes that are and coaches that are, that are working in that space. So I then went to do a, a master's in sports psychology. I then went to work in elite sport, um, soccer, rugby, cricket, golf. They were the main sports I was working in. And then I got really interested in some of the things I was seeing, especially with the transition of elite young athletes and why some of them made successful transition into the senior teams and why others didn't. I did a PhD to learn more about that. So I then did a PhD in a performance slash developmental psychology. And that became the foundations for Tougher Minds where we then continued to work in sport, elite sport, as we still do. So we work with the Premier League soccer managers, um, for example. But also we created an education program and we created a business program. So we now work across all those different contexts. But it always starts with, this is how our brain works. And here's how we can get our brain working better and automating more of the things that are going to make it easier for us to be healthy, happy, and at our best. And I think that was the biggest thing I learned. I used to coach soccer when the kids were young. So I would coach their mid middle school up through high school and so forth. And I would always try and get into their brain that there are two halves of this game. 
the one half is your physical abilities and your skills. The other half is your mindset. And I found at that level, nobody was talking about their mindset and their, their abilities and their desires of how to win, how to think differently, how to behave differently, and how much their attitude changed everything. You could see it, but they wouldn't always get it. So it, it, it was interesting. It really helped me get a better understanding and working with them. And I'm sure you're at a much, much higher level than I ever was with the kids. And that's what we'd like to talk about today. So let's start with the book. What inspired you to write the book, Habit Mechanic, Fine Tune Your Brain and Supercharge How You Live, Work and Lead? Yeah, so the Habit Mechanic book took me over 20 years to write. So there are bits of my undergraduate dissertation in there, for example. So over the past 20 years, and this is all I've ever done this career, is working in the fields of performance psychology, resilience, leadership development, team development, culture, etc. We've been constantly tweaking, refining, tweaking, refining our, our program. And what the Habit Mechanic book is, it's a manual for life. It's a toolkit for success. It's all that training we've developed over all those years in a, in a manual, in a book. And it works with the Habit Mechanic University app so that we can utilize some of the powerful uh, digital technologies that make it easier for us to change our behavior. The basic premise, this is why this is what I've observed over the past 20 years. So I've, I've done, as I said, these three degrees. I got told that if you can get people to know what they need to do to be at their best, that's it. You've nailed it. So in your example, Rocky, if you can get the kid to know you need to be thinking in, in this type of way to get the best out of yourself on the field, fantastic, you've done it. But I went into the field and I tested those ideas out and I quickly learned that people don't do what they know they should do. People do what they're in the habit of doing. And as I was very lucky that when I did my master's, I studied um, with scientists. They were really keen in bringing the latest thinking into their teachings. And when I was studying my master's, it was a few years after the French government had decided to invest in functional MRI scanners. So for the first time ever, we had this mass technology available that researchers were using to look inside brains in real time. We'd never been able to do that before. We had some um, understandings about human behavior and, and brains that are absolutely not true. So if you go back to about 25 years ago and you were asking the top neuroscientists in the world, what happens to brain development? after you've stopped physically growing, they would say, well, you're pretty much set for life. Your brain doesn't really change once you stop physically growing. When we got functional MRI scanners, that shows that that isn't the case. All our brains are changing all the time by a process called neuroplasticity. We've, our brains made up about 100 billion neurons. So what I, what I learned was that for the psychological sciences are about 70 years behind physiological sciences. So one of the first chapters in the Habit Mechanic book, I talk about Roger Bannister. Most people know Roger Bannister was the first person to run the sub four minute mile. Some people know when he did that, he was studying to be a medical doctor at Oxford University. Far fewer people know that he was also a research scholar at Oxford University. And the research he was doing in the physiology labs at Oxford were to investigate the role of oxygen in distance running. So in the 19, um, early 1940s, oh, sorry, late 1940s, early 1950s, he was physically getting people onto treadmills and he was measuring oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange and other peripheral indices and seeing what happened when you put people, when you made people run long distances, he was going inside the human body almost and analyzing what was going on. And he took those insights and he plugged them into how he trained and how he actually ran. You see, he'd got a bit of a weird running style because he, he learned very, he learned from that research that he had to get better at conserving oxygen. 
So Bannister was using technologies that actually had been available since just before World War II. So we've been able to look inside the human body, physically, not the brain, the body, since you know the early 1900s. We've only been able to look inside human brains for about 20, 25 years. And the human brain is the most complex thing in the known universe. And what we've started to learn, one of the big things we've learned about the brain is that most of what it's doing most of the time, our brain's number one operating room is to save energy. Because for most of our existence, energy has been a really scarce resource. So it tries to automate everything that it can. That's its number one operating tool. And the way we understand automation in the brain, we call it habits. A habit is what our brain is trying to do to everything, every process that we think and do in order to save energy. So we've seen people like Daniel Kahneman's work, Thinking Fast and Slow. He talks about brain heuristics, but he's really t- he talks about sorry thinking heuristics. They're really habits. They're thinking habits. We know someone like um, George Lakoff, professor at uh, Berkeley, California. He's the guy that talks about, don't think of a white elephant. But it's already there. You don't have to think consciously. We know people like Daniel Denny talks about our brain has the equivalent of a trillion minuscule cogs whirling round mindlessly. We we can't conceptualize what a trillion is. It's, it's too big for us to understand. So we, we've got this illusion of consciousness and that we're making all these clever decisions all the time. Um, but it turns out that most of the time we're running on 100% autopilot. At our best, we have 2% consciousness. But at our best, we're running on 98% um, subconscious uh, thinking and doing. So we're running on autopilot. So the basic assumption of psychology, helping individuals to think better so that they can do better, helping leaders to think better so they can lead better, the basic assumption is that if you can get people know what to what they need to do to do it, they'll be able to do it. Even in CBT, that's the assumption. Here's how you think, and how you think impacts what you do. Um, so there you go, great. So why did you practice thinking in this way? And then magic, you're done. Doesn't work. I, I read a study um, earlier this year, and it was a, a big study on depression. There were two intervention, two intervention groups. One was CBT intervention. That's the main training I got in my education, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. The second intervention was do something nice for your neighbor each day. The second intervention had a much more positive impact on people's depression than the first intervention. Why? Well, I would hypothesize because that second group We're doing something differently, and that's the key. So most of the psychological models, theories, training, the leadership training theories, the team development, the culture development, are based on what we call black box theories. They're based on, this this includes things like psychometrics. Psychometrics would have their, all psychometrics have their roots in science. It's about 100 years old, way before we understood how brains actually work. So what we mean by a black box is that they're based on theories that were designed before we understood how brains work, and therefore they're broken. So what I've done and my team over the past 20 years is we've taken the latest insights, not just from neuroscience about how how brains work, but also from behavioral science about why we do what we do. And we've coupled that with applied psychology, and we've created an entire end-to-end program that people can use to, first of all, understand how their brain works. Secondly, to analyze their habits, both um, an individual level, but also a team and a leadership level. And then we've given them the toolkit so that they can start to build new, sustainable, helpful habits. In simple terms, destroy their destructive habits and build more super habits. That is what the Habit Mechanic book is. I got fed up of reading books that repeated the same idea uh, 10 times, right, across 10, across 10 chapters. Um, they're just uh, a long article drawn out. The Habit Mechanic, I'm sure as you can 
testify to Rocky because you've read it is is a toolkit. It's a manual for life. And when you plug the app into that, and we also train people how to become certified habit mechanic coaches, we've got a really powerful, unique behavior change system that you can use individually in your team or across an entire organization. Um, and we've just released our app very recently. So we're really excited now about, we, we knew for years and years we can run training where you go into the organization, go into the hedge fund in the city of London, or even in, we go to America, get great feedback. People love it. It's simple. It's practical. It's based on science. I can use it now. But we knew that when we left the building, some of that change impetus got forgotten. So now we have a, a system where we can leave all of our insights in the building, both in physical products like the book, in digital support systems like the app, but also in people by training them to become certified having mechanic coaches. So yeah, the book is part of a bigger ecosystem, but it's an entire toolkit that's based on the best science. The reason we're having a mental health crisis, the reason it's harder to be a leader than ever before uh, isn't just because the world is more complex. It's because the systems are out there that are available to help people to think better and lead us to do better don't work. They are fundamentally flawed because they're not based on how brains actually work. Today's episode is sponsored by Profit Answer Man Podcast. Did you know that most small business owners hate looking at their financials? It's one reason they may struggle with business success. The Profit Answer Man podcast helps them ensure they are profitable and can pay their employees and weather the storms we all have to face. It's built on the Profit First methodology of pay yourself first. The Profit Answer Man podcast is a must listen to for every small business owner and anyone who wants to help them survive and thrive. Check it out on your favorite listening platform. And that's very helpful because the reality is over the last 100, 120 years, the world has dramatically changed, but we as people have not changed at all in that period of time. So what you're saying makes total sense. Just touching on the story of Roger Bannister, when I hear this story by told by most people, they all talk about it like a mindset shift. Oh, people didn't think it was possible until he did it. But nobody talks about what you talked about, which is the science behind how he did it. They all looked at it more like, oh, it's just a mindset shift. It was much more than a mindset shift. It was understanding the science of how our bodies work and then making that shift. A while ago, you, you said that you studied why some people make the jump from the level that they're at in sports to the elite level, and some don't. What is that differential that allows some people to make the jump, and what keeps others from doing that? Yeah, the key is being able, well, in our language now, the key is to become a habit mechanic. But that means getting really good at understanding and regulating your emotions. So emotions are the immediate drivers of, of, of what we think and what we do. Sometimes those emotions are helpful in getting us to think and do things that are helping us to be at our best. Sometimes those emotions are unhelpful. So it's getting good at recognizing those emotions, but then being able to manage them and actually being able to manage them so that you build what we call implicit emotional regulation habit. So emotional regulation can be very uh, effortful or it can, we can get it to the point. So it's almost like a habit. So it's implicit. It happens really fast. So it, in other words, emotional regulation can be quite a slow, effortful process or it can be a really fast process. We help people to build fast, implicit emotional regulation habits. But you know, th because that's a scientific term, it's confusing. What someone like Roy Burmeister would call so the, the, the neuroscientists call it emotional regulation. Someone like Roy Burmeister, Roy Baumeister, um, who's been cited over 200,000 times. Um, he's, he's the willpower guy. He talks about emotional regulation. And the outcome of 
of both those things is what I would call resilience. I see resilience as a two-part process. The first thing is to recognize that I'm doing or thinking something that isn't helpful for me. The second part is to be able to do something about it, be able to take positive action and ultimately create a different habit so that the way that you naturally, habitually do things is more helpful for you. Can you give us like an example that's more, you know, daily life? Like what would I do in daily life that I need to better my emotional regulations around? How do I catch it and how do I change it? Yeah. So what I will point out is if you go into the habit mechanic book, there are loads of what we call habit metrics tools at individual level, a team level and leadership level that make this very tangible. But just one example from a leadership level. I recognize that the way I communicate with my team is overly negative. Um, so that's step one. I've recognized that I've caught it. But, you know, I may have been aware of that for quite a while and I haven't done anything about it. So if I'm good at regulating my emotions, if I'm becoming a habit mechanic, what we call a chief habit mechanic, I'm able not only to recognize that, but to build a different habit in how I naturally communicate with people. So you would use what we call the action communicator self-assessment, which is in chapter 33. And you would start to use our habit building systems and our behavior change systems to help you to build a different way of naturally communicating. So that even when you're under pressure and you're a bit tired, that becomes your default, default way of communicating. So for example, you might be very deliberately, for every one negative thing you say to someone, you might be very deliberately packaging it with three positive things. Throughout the book, you use a metaphor of an igloo to explain all the pieces that we need to focus on. Why did you pick the igloo as that? Yeah, so the igloo relates to confidence. So, so becoming a habit mechanic is like a jigsaw puzzle. One of the parts of that puzzle is understanding your confidence and being able to build robust, what we call rock-solid confidence. Confidence is often misunderstood. We hear that that word um, esteem, it's all about esteem. Well, it's not. Confidence is a two-part construct. We've got esteem and efficacy. Esteem is what you believe. Efficacy is the evidence that underpins that. Now, here's an interesting thing. In the 1970s, the American education system identified that confidence was really important for young people being successful in later life and in education. So they said, how can we increase the confidence levels of our young people? So they said, well, why don't we make it easier for more people to get higher grades? Why don't we create a system where people don't lose every, anymore, everyone wins? Can you understand the things I'm talking about? Because they're real and they were implemented. And the lady called Carol Dweck, um, sorry, a lady called Jean Twang here, Jean Twang, she wrote a book called Generation Me. Jean Twang now is a very high profile in looking at the damaging impact of social media for, for young people, but also adults. The stories get, um, get squashed very quickly from you know, feeds in social media, <laughs> news outlet, because none of it is any good in terms of the, the consequences for using these devices and tools. But Jean Twang, she, she studied this, that she studied confidence levels, huge sets of data, in young people in America, and she wrote it up in a book called Generation Me. And she found that what, what the confidence intervention actually did was it created lots of people who had very high esteem but very low efficacy. So in other words, it created a generation, and it's still here and it's getting worse, a generation of people that have very fragile confidence levels. So they have high levels of belief in themselves, but when they get to setback, they crumble because they don't they don't have the evidence to underpin why they've why they're why they're good at this thing. So that's why we created the igloo to show, look, being confident and your life, any of our lives, is like a house in a state of igloos, if we're thinking it about ourselves through a confidence lens. We might have an igloo for our leadership. We might have an igloo for how good we are as a parent. We might have an igloo for how good we are at golf. We might have an igloo for how well our MBA is developing. We might have an igloo 
for how good we are as a friend to our uh, friend, to our family members, etc. And each of these igloos, you could rate, so you could list down what are the most important components of your life, and it might generate some of those uh, things that I just said then. And you could say, well, out of ten, where is it? Where is each area? Ten being it's perfect, one being it's an absolute disaster. And then you could start to zoom into one area. Let's say it's leadership you want to work on. And you could say, right, well, what am I, where's my evidence that I, that I have, so let's say I scored myself a five out of 10 as a leader. Where's my evidence for that? Okay, I'm a, I'm a really good communicator. I'm, I, I model things well. I know my job really well. And you could list, so you're listing down the, the ice cubes in the, in the igloo. This is your self-efficacy, it's your evidence. And then you say, okay, what's the most important thing I need to improve? You might say, well, I need to get much better in my language as a cultural architect so I can get much better at setting the strategic vision and you know, getting people to buy into that. So that's why we use the, um, the igloo metaphor. It's funny that you use the word fragile because I think that's what I hear people of my generation talking about the younger generation is they're fragile. They they break easily. They can't deal with any level of issues and so forth. And and this is probably the the big reason why that is and how it came to be, which is somewhat of a shame. And I think that was one of the things because of my upbringing and because of understanding generational cycles, we were really intentional with our kids to, in a sense, teach them grit and teach them a little bit more of, you've got to be able to stand on your own two feet. Um, And it's funny because, again, we'll go back to the coaching soccer. I was on the opposite side of the field. I have a very loud voice. It can be heard three, three fields over. My wife would be on the opposite side of the field and she'd hear the mothers like, oh, my God, look at what he's doing to the kids. He's scaring them this and that. Who's going to stop him? And she's like, that's his son. He's he's actually toughening him up. Let him be. And that was a big part of it. The kids who we coached became stronger mentally to be able to do that. And we actually used to quiz them to say, what's the one number one thing you fear? in being on sports teams and they always said getting yelled at which now that was a problem for me but i asked about it and what they said is we don't mind getting yelled at if you're encouraging us to do better it's when you yell at us without teaching us what we're supposed to do and we're getting yelled at for things we don't even know so they don't have any agency involved in it and I didn't understand all the science. I just had common sense of, you know, this is this is what I got to try and accomplish. Let's play around and see what we can do it. I think one of the biggest problems people have is they think they've got to take this massive action. But yeah, you use the acronym and you've got a ton of acronyms throughout the book, which I really love. That's the way we used to teach in soccer, too. We teach acronyms. The one acronym you have is T, which is tiny, empowering action which is little things like this this isn't that difficult take teeny steps i'd love for you to talk about that yeah there's a few different things there can i just take a step backwards there rocky yes. there's something interesting to dig into so one is we have a full curriculum for kids the kids learn our curriculum in schools so we have a curriculum to become a habit mechanic and it's the most important thing you can learn there's a couple of stories i've heard recently actually the two people though they're trained to become certified having mechanic coaches. One works with, talk about the confidence piece, but one works with and fragility of young people. One of the ladies, she's a really top business coach. Um, she works with some of the biggest companies in the world with the CEOs, with C-suite. And she was one of the clients she was working with. Um, she was observing some meetings in the business and she observed a, meet, a big meeting between sales and, and, um, and marketing. There's a bit of tension. And uh, a few things to iron out. And they got to the end of the meeting and she followed up with everyone and said, how do you think that went? And the senior people said, oh yeah, great, really good. We really got to the nub of what we need to get get to there. I think we've really made progress. The junior members said, didn't go well. No, that didn't go well. So why? Well, there was conflict. Uh, people disagreed. 
So that's that's the that's the world we're living in now, where people believe if there's a disagreement, there's a big issue. So we've got a real problem on our hands. We cannot move, make progress, and learn and develop without setbacks, without tension, without disagreement. I thought that was really interesting. And the second thing, actually, we started to work with one of the American Armed Forces. We're working with the Air Force at the moment, and um. We just, some read in our organization, read our book, and they said, look, I've got, I've been in psychology all my life. I did an undergraduate. I did a master's. I've been in the Air Force for 44 years. I've read your book. It's one of the best books I've ever read, and it's made me realize why most of what we're doing in this organization doesn't work, because it's all about knowing, and we're not actually helping people to change their behavior. But his observation, one of the things, you know, as equality and diversity becomes more and more central, is that it's become easier for people to say, my boss is discriminating against me and I'm going to take action, rather than actually recognizing, no, you just don't have a good relationship with your boss. It's not actually about discrimination, it's just that you don't like each other. So what we really need to work on is that relationship. Um, and again, it's that misunderstanding of the negatives and I don't feel good and therefore there must be this seismic problem and it must be about a discrimination issue rather than life isn't perfect and we're not all going to get on all the time and we won't always agree. So I see this as being really the, the, that basic issue of what the, what the ice in the igloo is speaking to is fundamentally problematic um, in, our, in, our, in the fabric of our society and it's not going away. Um, so yeah, the good news is we can do things. We can help people to make sustainable change. We have a model called the Nine Action Factor model. It's our, it's our proprietary behavioral science model, completely unpacked in the book. We can use this these nine factors. They are driving everything that we think and do individually and collectively. Um, I say to business leaders, forget about human beings being the most precious asset in your business, forget about human capital, you need to start focusing on habit capital because habits are running your organization and habits are not logical, they're not clever, they're not empathetic, they're just running round and around and around and that's what most of us human beings are doing most of the time. And habits are driven by nine core factors. And here's the good news. We know what those nine four core factors are. They're always on in all of our life. They're always on in all, all of our organizations. These factors drive a culture. And we know what they are. We can start to get them working for us instead of against us. The first factor is the TINY factor, which is what you were speaking about, the T acronym, TINY in power and action. As human beings, we can absolutely learn how to do things differently. We can learn how to think differently. We can learn how to do things differently, but we can only make tiny changes because our brain's number one operating rule is to save energy. So it doesn't like giving out, investing loads of energy into something that doesn't give any immediate reward. So an example of the tiny factor in action is, okay, I want to, I recognize that I need to get into shape a bit more and it would be a great idea if I started to do 50 sit-ups every day and 50 um, push-ups. So you set off in January, and the first day you do 50 sit-ups and 50 push-ups, and you feel like you're going to die at the end of it. And maybe you do it again, you, you do it for a week, but then after the second week, you just kind of quit, and it, and it goes, and all of a sudden you're in February, or you're into October, because you started at the end of the summer. A much more sensible way is to say, well, that, it'd be great. I know it'd be great to get to 50 push-ups and 50 sit-ups, but... I'm going to start with one push-up and one sit-up. Then tomorrow I'll do two. And the day after I might do two as well. But then I'm going to, maybe I'll do five and I'll build it up like that. So that's the tiny factor. And so we build this into our, this is our first tool that we introduce in the book in um, chapter one. It's called the Daily T Plan. And if you go into the Habit Mechanic University app, you can see people doing this every single day. I do this every day. So the T Plan is based around three questions. The first question gets us out of our habit brain and it makes us do what we call intelligent self-watching. So it, the question we ask ourselves is, how well did I do my best to be at my best and achieve my goals yesterday? 
10 would mean I was perfect. One would mean that I failed. And probably somewhere in between. And in the album, it's a digital tool. You just press a button and you score yourself. The second question is, what one tiny empowering action can I do today to give myself a better chance of being at my best? Let's say I scored a 7 out of 10 for yesterday. What can I do to give myself a better chance of getting an 8 out of 10 today? So I could say, well, only check the news once today. Or I could say, go for a five-minute walk at lunchtime. Or I could say, write a positive reflection at the end of the day. So I commit to one thing. And the more you understand about the Have a Mechanic program, the more sophisticated your answers will be there. The third question is, why? Why is doing that thing going to make it easier for me to be at my best? So I could say, well, if I only check the news once today, I'll be more focused, more efficient and effective with my time, less distracted. I'll get to finish work on time. I'll get to spend more time with my family. I'll sleep better, etc. If I go for a five-minute walk at lunchtime, I'll feel better. I'll be more productive in the afternoon. I'll get to finish work on time, so on and so forth. So in three simple questions, in two minutes, we've started to activate some of that behavioral science in a way that's going to make it easier for us to be at our best. And that's something we can makes we can really easily habitualize. And that's a big part of it is building the habits. I work with a lot of business owners. And, you know, the one thing I always say is your business is a system. People run the system. Most people, most business owners don't build a system for their business. They let people do whatever. And then somebody leaves and someone comes in and it's like, well, that's the way we always did it. Well, why? Nobody's ever actually thought about it and systematized it and put the processes in so that people can just run it. And the other thing we do is we have them build tiny habits. So when we started this conversation, you talked about your dad and how business went boom and bust, boom and bust. And what we try and do with business owners is say, take $1 out of 100 and just start putting it aside. Because during boom times, you'll never miss it. But during bust times, you'll have those extra dollars so that instead of riding a roller coaster in business, you're driving down a smooth road. But we always start small. Build the tiny habits. Don't You don't need to make massive change because people, people buck the system when you bring about massive change. And today you bring about massive change and it causes conflict and everybody shuts down, as you've already told us. So it's these little tiny changes and then showing up and doing them and all of them compound at the end of the day, you know, one becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight. You go out 31 days. And if you can double every day, you're at over a billion in, in results. And, and that is massive. And no one even needs to do that. I mean, even if you can just do a little bit, I think it's the power of showing up and making the, tiny, tiny changes. One of the things that you also talk about in there, and I think that's also helpful, is it helps to define where we want to go. You know, I call it purpose, but you talk about it in the book is the future ambitious story. Where is it that we're going and what are we trying to achieve? Future ambitious, meaningful story. Yeah. This is the thing is the tiny changes are only one of nine factors. Personal motivation is another one. And I can, I can unpack all of those if it's helpful. But yeah, so in order to fire up, so we show you what those nine factors are that are driving your behavior. So tiny is just one. Um, personal motivation is another, and we give you the tools to, to, to activate them for you. So the future ambitious, meaningful story, uh, in the out, we separate it into daily and weekly goals and long-term and monthly goals. But it's a way of intelligently structuring your goals. The metaphor we use is an iceberg, so we're building on the igloo ice metaphor. So we've got an iceberg. The top of the iceberg is a distant future. The bottom is today. And it gets us periodically mapping out, well, what do we want to have and do in the distant future, 10 years plus? Sometimes that paralyzes people because they don't want to commit to something. But I've never met anybody that doesn't want to be healthy and happy in the distant future. So I know that can always be the apex of what you want to work towards. And then you can say, well, if I want to be healthy and happy in the distant future, what does that mean I need to do and achieve in the next one to four years? And you could put some financial things into that. If I want to achieve those, those things in the next one to four years, what does that mean I need to do in the next 12 months? 
What does that mean for this month? What does that mean for this week? What does that mean for today? So we don't just show you what it's a good idea to be doing. We give you the tried and tested science-backed tools so you can activate it straight away, not only in your life, but in the lives of anyone that you want to help to be at their best. And that's important. That's what I tell people. When you know where you're going, it becomes easy to make decisions because you know where you're going. Is this taking me there or isn't it? And now all the decisions that you thought were so big are now so easy because you have clarity on what you're doing and doing in there. You also talk a lot about food, about sleep, and I know you've kind of touched on it. I believe you also talk about breathing in the book, correct? Yes. So everyone listening to this podcast is breathing. (laughs) And we don't know how. (laughs) Yeah. Well, this is the thing. Yeah. So it's always happening. It's a habit, right? And this is, people say, well, I don't believe that most of what I'm thinking and doing most of the time is a habit. And people also say, I don't think I'm thinking at all. If you don't think you're speaking to yourself right now, notice how you've just said to yourself, I'm not speaking to myself. I'm not crazy. It's here. It's all the time. We're just not wired to think of ourselves like this. So when we, um, when we experience a disconnection of meaning systems, in other words, a stress response, the fight or flight reaction kicks in. That's a two part process. This, this is happening in milliseconds. Let's just say an inbox, a, um, an email lands in your inbox from that person that you don't want to get an email from. Straight away, that gives you a final fight response. It unfolds in two ways. The first thing is you get this quite complex reaction in something called your HPA axis. So you're getting ready to do something, and there's lots of neurotransmitters that flood into the brain at that point. But the thing that we're interested in is that we start to breathe faster because that's the only part of that re- response you can control. So you notice that when you see an email from that person or that person walks into the room, you start to tense up a little bit, etc. That's because you're breathing faster. Your body's trying to take on board more oxygen and get rid of more carbon dioxide. The second thing that happens is our attention typically drifts onto the threat, the problem, the worry. Um, and the basic The basic model that we use to explain how the brain works in the book is the lighthouse brain. This idea your brain is scanning all the time and its first instinct is to look for threats, problems, worries, not just in the here and now, but also in the past, but also what might happen in the future. But yeah, the the first way to start dealing with the stress response is to slow down the breathing, is to reverse some of that fight or flight, um, process that's going on so in chapter 22 we unpack that and if you go into the app we can start to work with the stress coach that will impact that in an even more powerful way i know we haven't covered a lot in the book it's it's a thick book there's a ton to do we're not going to get through it in one episode is there anything though that we should have at least highlighted today that we didn't get a chance to yeah i think that if this is interesting to you get the book sign up for the app, it's free. This is a toolkit for life. It's a system for success. It benefits anybody. And if you're a business owner, it will give your business a a competitive advantage. Um, This stuff's more important than ever. And it's not common sense. It's really not. Um, I I was listening to a very high-performing ex-athlete and and coach on the podcast yesterday. And he was part of some of the most successful teams in his sport, you know, in history. And he said he often gets asked by um, his business friends, you know, what, what, how did you make that team work so well? And he says, well, you know, it's not really a scientist or not. And I say, that's absolute nonsense. So humans are not running on science. So why do we have medicine and why do we have, it's just that you don't know the answer. That's, that's all, my friend, you don't know the answer. So you, you attribute it to something mystical. It's absolutely not mystical. There is a set of operating rules that run our brain. So the way I think about it is that brains run your business and habits run your brains. Oh, sorry, yeah, habits run brains. And it's easier than ever for us individually and collectively to develop, to develop more and more unhelpful habits. And unfortunately, the systems that are in place in our organizations or in our daily lives to help us to be our best, to help us to think and do better, 
were not designed with the brain in mind. So they are highly ineffective. Um, the only way I know how to do it well is the have a mechanic approach. It is unique. So if you're interested, get the book, get the app, it's free. Just, you can start to explore the areas that are most meaningful for you. And I will say, this is the one thing that drove me up the wall a lot. When you see somebody who's really great at something, whether it's skiing or leadership or social media, and you ask them how they do it, they can't answer you. They just happen to be lucky that they were good at that one thing, but they don't know how. It's it's rare that you can find a person who can deconstruct what made them great and show you, if you do these steps, this is how you too can be great as well. It's time to learn the secrets of life. What's your secret to living an abundant life? It's making sure I understand and deploy my super habits. So there are lots of habits running, what I think and do, but some of them are more impactful than others. So something like one of my core super habits is every word day morning I go for a run first thing. And that has so many positive impacts throughout the course of the day. So it's understanding my super habits, deploying them, and also continually getting rid of my destructive habits. And knowing which are which. <laughs> knowing which is which, yeah. So in a nutshell, that's being a habit mechanic. That's what that is. What did you learn later in life that you wish you would have learned sooner? Yeah, well, I think the older you get, in my experience, the less you know. You know, you, think <laughs> you know everything when you're young, and then you learn that you don't. So I suppose... Uh, you know, taking the time to reflect and plan and and just, yeah, I think that's maybe the key thing is that I've got an awful lot to learn about how to be my best. And I believe I will be doing that until the day that I die. And I love that mindset. I'm I'm the same way. I'm constantly learning, constantly improving, constantly doing that. And that's part of the reason for this podcast. It allows me to achieve that. So let's go back to the other end of the spectrum, which you kind of talked about the young person. If you were to give an 18-year-old one specific piece of wisdom, what would it be? Read the habit mechanic. If I'd have had that toolkit when I was 18, I think, you know, my life would have been um, not better than it is now, but I would have been able to help even more people than I have already because that is my passion. You know, why is never why why don't people teach us how our brain works? Now it was excusable, Rocky, when we went to school, so we didn't actually know. But now we do. It should be the first thing we get taught. And also then how to become a habit mechanic. It has to be part of the curriculum because these are the skills young people need. So whether you're at um primary school or your secondary school or university. You need these skill, these skills, or even in businesses, this is just foundational knowledge. And that's why I'm so glad these resources are out there and so freely available. And it's true. They don't teach you money in school. They don't actually teach you how to think. They teach you what to think. And they don't teach you all the skills that you really need to be great, nor do they teach you how to decide on what you want in life. They kind of put you on a track without you exploring, hey, what am I great at? What do I like doing? And what would bring me happiness and enjoyment? If people would like to learn more about you, the book, the app, where do they do this? What's the best way? Yeah, so you can get the app for free. And the app contains unlimited on-demand expert habit coaching. It's there, it's free. Everything we've learned is in there. You can access it so you can be coached for nothing in the app. Your people can as well. It's in the App Store, the Apple App Store. It's in the Google Play Store. It's the Habit Mechanic or Habit Mechanic University. You can also go to tougherminds.co.uk. And I know that the links will be in the show notes um, where you can learn more about what we do. You can get see the app there as well and get the book. Um, the physical book is on Amazon. There's a link to that in the bottom of the show notes. And if you're interested in training to become a certified Habit Mechanic coach or training people in your business to do that, just reach out and we can discuss that. We also do keynotes and run bespoke training programs. But you can learn more at the website, get the app, say hi in the app to us. And um, yeah, it'd be great to have a conversation. 
Thank you so much for joining us. We'll put that all in the show notes. Thank you, Rocky. It's been a pleasure. What did you take away from this episode? For me, one of the big things was that real change comes from forming new habits. It's not about willpower or mindset. It's about making those changes and making them part of our routine. He shared some great practical tools like the daily tea plan to start analyzing our habits and making tiny improvements. I encourage you, pick one and just work on that and then start building it up daily. The reality is, and we've talked about this, everything in life compounds. So all you got to do is take small steps and continue to take small steps. And that is how change comes about. We've also had some episodes about some ways to get a rapid kind of rewiring. So if that's of interest, go back and listen to those. By the way, who do you know who would also benefit from listening to this episode? Would you do me a favor and please share it with them? I'd appreciate that. Next week, we've got Alicia Power on to talk about how to live in alignment with your soul's true calling. I know you'll enjoy it. Thanks for listening. Have an abundant week.